about uh, Chile's, think about uh, Chile's uh, history. Um, it, because that, that very much kind of has guided where it is today. Uh, the uh, Spanish initially um, arrived, uh, I think Cortez uh, might've been the first mid 1500s. Uh, he uh, brought with him uh, vines from, from Spain um, and from the surrounding islands and uh, planted. And this, um, this kind of established uh, the, the, the wine traditions of, of Chile. Uh, the, the Spanish, um, you know, took their vines kind of throughout the country uh, and um, made, made viticulture that the, the indigenous tribes that lived there actually, even though they were not thrilled to have the Spanish there, some of them even did adopt some of the vines to produce um, not really wine, but grape-based, slightly fermented beverages. So it really did influence um, the country uh, vastly. Uh, then, so uh, the Spanish um, occupied uh, Chile until early 1800s, uh, got its independence, um, and but but kind of the tone had been set, and the um, there were a lot of things that. Europe, I would say that the, the, the connection to Europe brought to uh, Chile. First of all, um, in the, about 1830, um, Chile set up a, uh, a nursery, a vineyard nursery um, to propagate uh, vineyards. And that's, that's important because in Europe um, in the mid 1850s, um, a root born louse called phylloxera wiped out uh, a lot of their vineyards. And so basically Chile was able to quarantine original rootstock, uh, I mean, original vine stock rather that, that had been brought from Europe uh, safely. Um, and to this day, they don't partly, I mean, largely due to the fact of the content of their soils, the high elevation, um, they don't have issues with phylloxera. They've got some, um, some little nematodes that can damage vines, but they do not have uh, phylloxera, which affects, I mean, the United States gets affected by phylloxera, everybody, um, for the most part. Uh, there are some areas that are phylloxera free, but for the most part, phylloxera is a constant threat. And Chile uh, was able to avoid it then, and they still are able to avoid it. So they, they started doing a lot. Uh, they planted uh, quite a bit. Um, but then uh, in the mid, I think it was early 70s, mid 70s, um, political unrest, uh, military dictatorships, uh, Pinochet. Um, it, it, a lot of the vineyards were yanked out um, and uh, what wasn't yanked out was heavily taxed. So it really, it wasn't a good time for Chile. Um, but again, they still had, um, you know, a large uh, uh, history with, with grape growing. Um, in in the early, so it would be the late 80s, early 90s, um, private ownership, actually it was 82, 82 private ownership um, went back to Chileans. So they could, they could, they could own their own property and do what they want with it. And in, from around 1990 until 2000, um, great production um, quadrupled um, in Chile. So there was a huge amount of, of planting. Um, so, the reason that that history is all important is that Chile really was shaped today by um, the by Europeans um, and the grapes that they grew, and that's largely what Chile does well today. Um, the The country, I mean, it's you know, Argentina and Chile are very similar uh, in many ways. They both share um, a lot of property along the Andes where they can uh, plant grapes. Uh, but Chile's little piece is, is I think it's 20, 23, 2400 miles long, uh, about 200 miles wide. Um, it's, very, it's very long, but it's very narrow. So they don't have vast amounts of space. Uh, what they do have is, is foothills. And so that's great for grapes and it's great for a lot of different grapes. Um, and what has happened in the last 
about 10, 12 years is um, a transition because initially, I mean, initially, uh, Chile was, was a huge exporter of, of wine. Uh, even even to the you know early two thousands mid two thousand uh, mid mid twenty tens early twenty tens rather uh, Chile was exporting seventy eighty percent of of their wine uh, they're they're producing a lot more and it was and it was largely a bulk scale um, not not horrible quality but just the average seven to twelve dollar bottle so fast forward to today. All of that was like the precursor to now. And about five years ago, there, there was a, a, a movement, about 10 years ago, a movement to uh, kind of move back towards small scale farming, boutique farming, uh, focusing more on growing quality than quantity. And that is, that is really kind of what is making Chile kind of exciting right now. Uh, and so, these two wines uh, really represent that. Um, they're, they're classic varietals. So Sauvignon Blanc, a uh, very classic French varietal. Uh, Syrah, uh, varietal uh, from Southern France. So these are very classic to, to um, their history. However, they are very small production, relatively. Uh, a couple thousand cases, three, 4,000 cases per, per, um, uh, per wine. And this is kind of where Chile is moving. And, and I think we're going to see even more diversity with grapes. Um, there are some grapes that are, that are used there. Um, there's a grape called the Mission Grape. It's also called Pais. But when I was getting into wine 20 some years ago, this was, this was like worse than Skid Row wine. I mean, it was really bad. And we were all taught to despise Pais. It, it, it was like watery Kool-Aid that why would you drink it? And there, there's some really old Pais vineyards in Chile now that are being remanaged and the wine that they're making is really outstanding. Uh, unfortunately, I could not track down a Pais for this tasting. I may, I may try to do that next tasting uh, just so that we can try one. But, um, but so Chile is, is it's, a, it's an exciting place right now. It's, it's both very old um, and yet kind of in its infancy in, in the modern wine world. And so it's, I think it's a lot of value, um, high quality wine. I mean, nature is able to produce these wines. Uh, they have um, ocean currents and mountain currents, grapes, grapes kind of like that warm day, uh, cool night uh, environment. And this, and Chile is pretty much entirely that. Um, some places are drier in the Northern part of Chile. Uh, it's one of the driest places on the planet. They, they don't think it's rained there in over a hundred years. Um, and, and then in the South, you can see penguins. I mean, it really has everything. So matching different grapes to different topographies, uh, and to different terroirs and different climates, it's really possible. And that's kind of where we're going. So without further ado, let's taste the first wine. So a uh, little bit quickly about the winery. Uh, the winery is called Polcura. Um, it was started by uh, two Chileans who, um, when they came up with the idea, they were actually both working in Europe, one in France, one in Spain. And they, they both kind of came to the same conclusion that um, class, particularly classic style, cool climate Syrah was really compelling. And they wanted to do just primarily just uh, classic style, terroir driven Syrah. Uh, so they came back to Chile and uh, I think it was around 2002, they finally, they scoured the land, uh, scoured the country, looking for one particular piece of property and they found it. And the picture that I had of it, unfortunately it wasn't as good as this one. This is the same area. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, it's, uh, there's a, there's a mountain range, uh, buffering the, um, the, the vineyards from direct exposure to the ocean. Cause the, you know, you've got, um, uh, cold water. There's a, there's a famous current called the Humboldt current, which, uh, runs along Chile and brings in, uh, cooler water. You've got, um, breezes that, uh, winds that come up from Antarctica. 
So um, there are times where, where storms are really aggressive. And this particular area is, is sheltered by uh, a mountain range. So it gets the benefits of the cool climate. It just doesn't get the aggression of, of horrible weather. Uh, so these two gentlemen uh, found this piece of land. Um, it's very arid, obviously, uh, but the water is, they, they, can, they can use minimal drip irrigation. They don't have to irrigate that much. And in fact, some areas are, are dry farmed. Uh, the soil really complex, um, lots of lots of decomposed granite. Um, there's schist. There's there's a lot of volcanic uh, activity. I mean, because Chile basically sits along that what's called the Ring of Fire. Uh, Tonga unfortunately had some activity with that recently, but um, it is uh, it, it's very. I mean, it was created through through um, volcanic activity. And so the soils are really minerally, really complex. And uh, in the case of the Syrah, perfectly suited. And we'll talk more about that. Um, the first wine is a Sauvignon Blanc. And it comes from um, a, a region uh, that is about, it's, it's a little bit further north. The Syrah uh, comes from a, a region called Colchagua. Uh, the, uh, the Sauvignon Blanc comes from a region closer to the ocean, uh, very, in fact, very close to the ocean, uh, about five kilometers, uh, called Leda. And Leda is famous for their whites, particularly uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Sauvignon Blanc likes um, cool climate. Um, it doesn't, doesn't like a lot of warm. Uh, it needs uh, you know, warm-ish days, but cool nights, long growing season. Um, so that it can develop a lot of flavor, but also still retain a lot of acidity. Uh, it also likes uh, very much um, limestone and granite. And so this area of Leda uh, has a lot of that. And uh, I think it really, it really shows up in the wine. Um, this, the, cool, the cool climate um, allows the, the fruit to develop um, a lot of aromatics, um, floral, uh, tropical fruits, things like that. And then the, the, the soil retains that real zip of acidity. So let's try this. Let's try this wine and see what you think. It, um, I, I mean, this is, this is a great example of a, of, a, of a wine with high minerality. I mean, it almost prickles the tongue you can taste this um, almost spritziness, uh, tingliness. Um, I don't know if that's a word. Oh well, it, uh, it, it but it has a it has a vibrancy, and that that is that is direct. I mean that is uh, dictated by the the soil and by the the, the um, uh, mineral content in the soil. Um, very citrusy, nice nice lemon, a uh, little grapefruit peel. Maybe some tropical fruits, some white flowers. Uh, very, very vibrant wine. Uh, delicious with, if any of you have some goat cheese, delicious with goat cheese. Um, anything out of the water is, is delicious with this. Uh, salty fried foods, delicious. Sushi, um, lots of things, lots of things go with this wine. Steve? Any, any, yes, ma'am. I had an idea that I forgot to uh, mention. I had this idea after last month. Um, I thought it would be fun if you want to just to put your own wine rating in the chat. And I thought I would read. Um, I know people don't give a lot of credence to those little signs that some of the liquor stores uh -huh. put under the wine, the 92 or whatever. But I thought I would quickly read. Um, this is a just a, a scale, I guess. Um, so it's on a 100 point scale. And 85 to 89 is a very good, very good wine, a wine with special qualities. 90 to 94 is an outstanding wine of superior character and style. And 95 to 100 is a classic, a great wine. So I just thought it'd be fun if you, if you want to weigh in on that, put your score for this particular wine in the chat, and then we can just review them. What do you think? Well, I... My only, my only hesitancy is, and, and if you, you know, as you know, um, <laughs> there are no scores in my store. I know. And it, and it, <laughs> and it, and it comes down to, I don't honestly know how to gauge it in that way. 
I can, I mean, there are tasting grids and, and there are um, usually a taste. I mean, there's a, there's a standardized tasting grid and it will deal with about five qualities, um, uh, aroma, color, body, alcohol, uh, palate, non-fruit, fruit. I mean, there, there, there are a whole bunch of things in that grid. And even with that grid, which is very thorough, there is no numerical um, approach. I mean, no, no numerical score given using that grid. Um, that's it. Um, I guess what I do like is um, maybe, maybe if, it's, if it's like Michelin, uh, the, the Michelin um, food reviewers, which I always, I always cite this example because if you think about it, Michelin is, is the French tire company. Their entire industry uh, revolves around being amazingly precise. They can't make a tire to an average, you know, size and weight. It, it's it's dead on solid perfect, and um, they even have concluded that the best way to do it is by one star, two star, or three star. So, I I, I like that. Um, Okay. It, it it allows a little it allows a little little uh, wiggle room, but um, for me, uh, I would say uh, this wine. I would put this, and I don't mean this disparagingly. I would I would put it at maybe a, a one and a half to two star because I got I have to leave some room for some truly amazing wine. What I like about this wine is that it's varietally correct. That's important. I mean, if, if you're buying an orange in the grocery store, you really, really, really want it to at least, at the very least, taste like what you know an orange to be, which this this does. Um, actually, you know what? I, mean? I would give this two stars because it has, it has varietal characteristics, uh, which are important. And then it has kind of the qualities of the terroir. So if this were grown in a warmer climate, it would not taste this way. If this were grown in very fertile um, say alluvial soil, it would not taste this way. So it's, it's captured the sense of where it's from. And I, and I like that. So I would say, um, you know, truly the number of wines that are really like three-star wines, I mean, it's, it's rare. Um, they should be rare. They should be the wines that, you know, I, I can think of maybe a dozen wines in my life that I've had over, you know, 20 some years that, that just blew my mind. But I've had thousands of wines since then. So I think that, you know, the reason I don't put scores in the in the in the in the in the store is that I will tell you they're absolutely advertising, uh, paid, paid advertising. Yeah. There's there is no UNICEF of wine reviewing. <laughs> um, and it is, I mean, and unfortunately, we hear about all of the times where reviewers are caught emailing for money or something like that. The public generally doesn't. Um, so there's, yeah, I, okay. I yeah. Well, anyway, I was just, I, I, say, I, I, I was just trying to get people involved a little bit more and yeah. so any kind of, but Cap Gray did it, you know, Cap, oh, and now Jack and Maureen have done it. Cap just says no grapefruit taste in this wine, which is fine with me. I like the minerality and um, I can't, what is that word? Terror, land-based. Terror. Terroir. Terroir. That's it. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't study mm -hmm. French. This uh, wine I would buy again. Yeah. So just let us know if you would buy it again and what you yeah. think and put it in the chat and we'll read them. And that, and that is, I mean, you know, when, when we're doing formal tasting, we often say, you know, Hey, um, if you, if, if putting a smiley face next to the wine is meaningful to you, <laughs> you're the only person who it needs to be meaningful, you know, for, I mean, it, it so having a, having a scale, I mean, the other thing is, I guess, going back to numerical scores, numerical scores implies that there is a perfect wine. There isn't. There's, there's never been a, a truly perfect wine. It can always be better in some way. Um, but there are, I guess it also, it, it, you know, people, I, I, know, I know people who shop exclusively by scores. And what I always tell people is, well, you know, I love sushi. I will travel the world for great sushi. If you don't like fish, do you really care how fresh it is? Um, if this isn't your bag, 100 points is, doesn't matter. And more time, I think, should be spent thinking about 
what sort of wines make you happy? What, what sort of wines really do you really connect with? And not what did some guy who's making, you know, $30,000 a visit to a winery think about this wine? Um, because that in, in many cases, that's how it actually is, is playing out. Uh, so yeah, use, use whatever is meaningful to you and, yeah. and like, like the wines that you like. Yeah, and we're getting some great comments. I encourage you to read them. Just open your chat and you'll get to read them all. Uh, we've got a smiley face already um, from Rosie yeah. and Larry. Yeah. And, and, and Lisa's comment, I have to read, uh, good, better, best. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is better than some of the Spanish wines mm -hmm. we've tried. Mm -hmm. Less wet dog aroma. There's a descriptor, wet dog aroma. Oh, yeah, yeah. It. Um, there, it, actually, it's, it's funny. Um, I was tasting a wine the other day and uh, <laughs> I, I, it smelled like sheep's wool. And all I could think of was the, was um, the, the movie Anchorman and uh, <laughs> uh, lanolin, like sheep's wool, lanolin. Uh, but, but that, that's what I smelled. It smelled like sheep's wool. Um, so there, there are, uh, I would say that oftentimes what dictates, I mean, some things are, uh, off aromas um but the wonderful thing about wine is that there is such a diversity chemically that can mimic so many different things um and yeah this this wine this wine is uh, 90 percent stainless steel uh 10 percent neutral oak so it, it clean it's going to be clean um that is it's it's fermented in a in a cool temperature it really shouldn't it would be flawed if it had any sort of a uh, wet dog or, or, or even, I mean, <laughs> even Lionel, um, it, it, that, that would, that would be, it shouldn't be there because of the way this wine was made, I would say. We're getting some great reviews. Feel free to add yours and any questions you might have. Have your moment, have your re wine reviewer moment. And if, I mean, we can also move on to Syrah. If sure. Yeah. Ready to, ready to do that. Sure. Okay, so this this is I will say um, this is a wine that uh, really exemplifies some of the oldest uh, styles of wine in in France. Um, this is so this is Syrah, but in an old world in an old world way. Um, it has uh, lots and lots of dark fruits. So think um, blackberries, black cherries. Um, there's a little bit of a, a menthol or a eucalyptus to it. Um, black pepper. Um, it sees it sees very uh, cool days, which which give it a, a sort of a peppery note. Um, but this is the reason that the 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 two winemakers decided to pursue Syrah is that. Syrah is, it's it's been planted. I think it was first planted in southern France, maybe. 1100 AD. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, 1200 AD um, in in France. So it's it's got a lot of lot of history. It also uh, likes lots and lots of rocky, minerally soil. Uh, in fact, Polkura is uh, is a Mapuche is a local uh, indigenous tribe language. Uh, in, in the in the Mapuche language um, means um, yellow stone. So the 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 rock here, the limestone is yellow. So this gets rooted in this in this yellow limestone, and it develops um, some really really tannic structure. Uh, lots, I mean, that kind of uh, walnut skin dryness on this. Um, now, the one thing about Syrah is that it really is a food wine. There are a lot of wines that really, I mean, the Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it's great with food. It's great without food. Syrah really, and and I would I would argue actually Cabernet as well because of the uh, the the richness, the 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 tannic structure, the dryness of the wine. It really needs some fat. It really needs something else to complement it. And in if you go to the website for Polkura, they uh, they talk about how they decided to ha to to grow Syrah because they were having. Uh, lamb chops with mint sauce, and that is a classic pairing for for Syrah. In part because it's got sort of a uh, uh, horse saddle, leathery kind of um, animally kind of note to the to it um, as 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 a complexity to it. Uh, but it's a delicious food wine. 
um, it really does need almost need food to really to really see its its full potential. Yeah, I can smell and and the eucalyptus. Um, in fact, I can see in the kind of in the background of my background uh, looks like maybe some eucalyptus trees. Uh, there's a there's a region uh, a little bit north of here. Uh, I'm sorry, south of here called Maipo, and uh, the Cabernet is is famous in Maipo um, for having what they call Maipo mint, and it's this it's this mintiness. Um, mint slash eucalyptic eucalyptic note um, on the nose and palate uh, that, that really defines it. But this Syrah, um, it, it needs a warm day, but it needs a cool night. Otherwise, it kind of gets really boozy and sloppy, uh, but very minerally. I mean, and, and for me, like when I talk about minerality with, with red wines, it's kind of think maybe like uh, the smell of wet concrete or smell of wet gravel. Um, it's not so much a taste as just a presence of, or maybe the smell of sea salt. It's a, it's a presence of something, some minerals. Um, maybe it's, maybe it's just more of a, of a made up wine term, but, but the pursuit of minerality is probably, um, a, a futile one. I don't, I don't know. Uh, a lot of people disagree whether about minerality, but I, I would say, you know, you, you know, it's there when it's there, or, you know, when you see it. Yeah, a lot of dark fruit, a lot of tannic structure, black berries, a dark currant, black plum. I mean, a lot, a lot of dark fruits. Um, and it does see French oak. They they do favor French oak. Um, there, there's a lot a lot of Chilean winemakers will use French oak. So French oak will give the wine. Um, it'll enhance the pepperiness. It'll give it some baking spice notes, maybe some clove or cinnamon in the background. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot going this going on in this wine, but I would definitely say it's, it's a wine that, uh, with, with probably some red meat, uh, definitely lamb, uh, but something, something with some fat to kind of temper that, that dryness, uh, would be great. But this is, these guys are doing some, some really cool work. Um, Syrah is, uh, something that, that, really requires some some skill at producing well um it uh, australia became famous for and then sort of criticized for producing very um overly ripe uh structuralist syrah allowing it to overproduce and and create wines that were were, were fine to drink but uh quality wise um not 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 to their potential uh, interestingly, actually, uh, Australia is, is moving back toward, I mean, Australia has had a long history of wine and they're moving back toward quality uh, over quantity, which is really nice because they can make amazing wine when, when they, they just rein in some of those things. But uh, so what do people think about this one? Well, I do. I do have a, I think Jack, Jack Altman must have had a peek at your notes for tonight, but he said, I'm trying to Syrah with two Christinis. One is Gruyere with chicken livers, and the other is blue cheese with balsamic yeah. cherry. Yeah, they make yeah. the wine great. Yeah, it's not a big fan of just the wine, but the food yeah. yep. is what makes it a keeper. No, and that that is, if you think about it this way, I mean, like I said, there are some wines that absolutely stand on their own, but the vast majority of the wines that we really love um, came from Italy, France, Spain, and Portugal. Uh, and those are all, and Greece, and those are all places with food cultures. So the wines that, that really shine um, probably have a food component. I mean, we, in the, in, the, in the wine business, we always use the things that grow together, go together, uh, adage for food and wine pairing. And it's, it, it's true 99% of the time. Um, if you find a wine that has evolved, I mean, for example, um, Syrah, um, and Grenache and Syrah and Grenache blends do very well with lamb. Um, in, the, in the Rhone Valley, there is not a lot of topsoil. Um, in fact, there are some areas that look uh, sort of like somebody dumped river rock all over. And we've, we've actually visited one of those, those uh, uh, regions in the past. Um, the two things that grow together uh, are grapes and sheep because the sheep can find little, you know, little, little, 
little green green sprouts popping up in between the rocks and and are able to 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 groom the vineyards so in that case the sheep are growing up next to the vines and they they work very well um so i, I would say you know classic wines and certainly syrah is a classic wine classic wines usually have a food pairing uh from their or from their place of origin and um yeah the i mean you were talking about uh, chicken livers i mean you've got some iron notes well there's a lot of minerality in this that iron is going to accentuate the flavor of those chick of that chicken the cherries um the cherries are going to bring out the cherry flavors and the balsamic actually i do even get a little balsamic in here uh in the wine so those those are going to um the addition of that flavor and that chemistry is going to take that food uh and and turn it up a notch i mean that's that's kind of really the there, 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 there's not a precise science to food and wine pairing, but there are definitely some things that work better than others. And in this case, I, I completely agree. That sounds, my mouth is watering. That sounds delicious, uh, the Cristini. Yeah, and I don't know if you all are keeping up with the chat, but Lisa, who said she wasn't really into Syrah, so she wasn't really looking forward to trying this one, said she's having blueberry thyme goat cheese and was amazed. Oh, yeah. At, there she is. See, she's showing, yeah. and, showing and telling. Um, and she's eating a few olives. Yep. Lisa, you want to unmute yourself and just, <laughs> because we can unmute if, at this point. Um, but she said, it seems to change the wine or my tongue, really different experience. Mm -hmm. So yep. it, she's a believer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, there are, there are wines that I truly, if I have by themselves, I, I will sip it once or twice and I'm good. Uh, if I have it with the right food, uh, I'm, you know, I might finish the bottle. It really, and it's that, it's that I, I, I thoroughly enjoy looking for those experiences. Like what, what possibly could work with this? And you take a bite of something and you know, it when it doesn't work, it sounds funny. Um, I mean it, but there are, there are times where things get metallic, um, off flavors pop out, you lose the taste of what you actually want to taste. I mean, there are times where it really doesn't work, but when it does work, it, it, ca it, it catches your attention. And, um, and I, I think it's, I think it's fun. That's, that's the, I mean, you know, and, and again, going back to the old world, uh, you know, a lot of the places we, we stole their, from, from where we stole our grapes, uh, they're, Wine is at the table every single day and night. I mean, it it just it's always there, and that's kind of how how probably things that grow together go together came to be. They were like, you know, we grow this stuff. We need to find something that works with it. And uh, yeah, 10, 20, 30 years later, a uh, hundred years later, they they've got it, you know, perfected. So um, yeah, I'd play around with that. I mean, because generally uh, th there's some guidelines that will help guide. I mean. So blueberries, um, the, the, the thyme, the cherries. So herbal, stone fruits, all of that I get in here. Um, and so when you pair that, you're gonna get, um, you, know, com, you know, things will con contrast and accentuate. Um, and, then, and then the more tannic uh, a wine is, and this has a decent amount of tannic structure, the more tannic a wine is, the the more the more fat content you really want, because that fat will will cut um, the 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 tannic and and tannin and and make it less astringent. Um, it'll also, um, I mean, in the case of say Cabernet and beef, uh, the the tannin from the Cabernet uh, tempers the fat, which and 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 the acid wash and kind of moves the the fat off your tongue, and so you taste more of the beef. Um, it actually brings out more flavor. So, uh, yeah, food and wine pairing is that's I we'll have to figure out a way of doing kind of a maybe a food and wine pairing uh, thing. That would be fun to do where we really kind of because they're the exploring is all is, is the best part. Yeah. And I've got a question. Right. So it's it's cold weather. Right. And a lot of us are uh, this is off. I, this won't pertain to these wines tonight necessarily. Um, who knows? But. So just random question, I for one am making a lot of chili and I always do during cold weather. Mm -hmm. And I have always heard that spicy foods like chili, mm -hmm. red or white, mm -hmm. um, are really hard to pair. So just 
off the top of your head, what would you recommend with a with a red chili? Um, with a red chili, I there's there's actually a wine that I like a lot, and I I I know I've had it with. Mm, I think I've had it with red chili. I, I know I've had it with pork and hatch, roasted hatch chilies, chili. Um, but there's a, there's a wine from, uh, from, from Chile uh, called Carmenere. And Carmenere uh, originally was, was thought to have been Merlot. Uh, and Merlot is, 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 a, is a grape that while it grows many, many places, it doesn't really like to. It doesn't grow well in many, many places. And when it's grown in the wrong place, it develops um, sort of this overt vegetal. It's very green bell pepper. Um, you, you notice a lot of bell pepper to it. And so people just assumed that this Chilean Merlot would had a, a, a bell pepper note, while actually kind of a nice bell pepper note was still under red Merlot. It turned out it was a totally different grape called Carmenere, which naturally has pyrazines in it, in its profile, the pyrazines, the, 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 the chemical compounds that make green pepper taste like green pepper. Um, and so I really like one of my favorite wines for um, South red wines for Southwest food um, is, uh, is Carmenere because it has a lot of fruit. Uh, it has a soft texture, like Merlot doesn't have a ton of tannin. So tannin is usually when you add in spice, tannin and alcohol are usually the two components that turn to, that take something that's hot and turn it into a raging inferno. Um, Carmenere has, has a modest amount of alcohol, but primarily not as much tannin as some other reds. And then you have that green pepper note. And so, you know, think about all of the things that in, in um, Mexican or Latin American cooking that have green things. I mean, lime, uh, jalapeno, cilantro, lettuce, avocado, bell pepper. I mean, you got all these things that, that having just a tinge of, of green bell pepper to it actually works. And so I love Carmenere with uh, like Carmenere and street tacos, I, I think that's delicious. Um, as far as a, like a white chili, um, I would actually go back to the Sauvignon Blanc um, mm -hmm. because Sauvignon Blanc too has, um, favors a lot of green things, um, sometimes even jalapeno, but definitely lime skin, uh, sometimes cilantro, sometimes tarragon. It, it has green things in its profile that are, suitable rather than an indication of uh, they picked it too early uh which you know again uh ripeness depend it depends on how you use the lack of ripeness and and green flavors are basically underripe flavors um sometimes they're very well positioned and other times um they ruin the wine but yeah i i i think that i mean admittedly um beer is a, an outstanding pairing with chili um but uh, lighter, lighter alcohol, lighter tannin reds, uh, Pinot Noir also can, can work. So depends on the spice. Uh, and then, yeah, for the reds, um, if you wanted to go with something even more aromatic, you could try maybe like a dry Riesling um, or maybe a Spanish Fiora, something like that. But uh, no, wine definitely, you can, you can definitely find a, a, a pairing for, from, from Chile. Definitely. Well, thanks. Thanks for indulging me. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, no, I didn't thanks. have any questions in the chat, so I just thought I'd throw one out there. <laughs> but I did want to say, um, Janie Marple says they're having avocado with a little EV, EVOO, extra virgin olive oil, yeah. and salt yeah. tonight. And they said it's very good with both wines. And that reminded me, that reminded me, and I'm going to let you put in a little plug just because you're so good to do this for us every month. You all are carrying a certain kind of olive oil that we happen to buy um it's italian am i correct that is correct yeah um, and you're getting i know you're getting more in which is why i want you to talk about it briefly but um i i tell you what i i'm not a big connoisseur of olive oil and i think that would be a fun sampling to do sometime although i realize it probably had to be has to be done in person but that olive oil was outstanding and i just wanted to know how you happened to start ordering that olive oil into your wine store? Um, that, um, that olive oil, there was, 
I, I think it went back to, I've, I've actually known the, the producer of that or, or, or I've never met him in person. I've corresponded extensively uh, with him since maybe 2000. Um, but uh, his name is, is uh, Ettore Vanucci. Um, Ettore and his family uh, have an olive grove uh, near uh, Rada uh, in Chianti and have been, uh, they, they actually have, I think they have a villa as well that they uh, receive guests, but um, Olives is kind of Atori's main gig. Uh, but he, I had, I, had, I, I had a friend who said, you know, I, I know this guy who makes really great olive oil, you try it. So I, I, I contacted Atori in the early 2000s and ordered some and it was, it was delicious and I've been ordering it ever since. And uh, last year, I was ordering, I, I order it as often as I can. Um, he, the, 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 the winery is called Capovento. I mean, the, uh, the, the olive oil is, is uh, made by Capovento, his company and uh, his estate. And it, the, the oil that we have is, is what he calls super Etruscan. Uh, it's from a, uh, a, a grove that, that used, I guess it was where the, the ancient Etruscans used to battle um, but, uh, he only makes, it's, it's, um, made from an olive called Frantoio and he only makes it in the very, very best harvest. I mean, like grapes, olives are, are not of the same quality every year. And so he only makes, uh, super Etruscan, um, in the best, best, uh, harvests. Um, 20, it would be 2021 was not one of those harvests. Um, so what we have is, is 2020. But yeah, I am in the process of trying to get some more. We sold out the first lot. Uh, I am trying to get some more uh, shipping right now. It was sort of a challenge, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, try. we, if, if we don't get, if we don't get it this year, uh, we will get his next harvest, I'm certain. Um, but uh, olive oil, I mean, this, this oil, it's, it, it kind of has this golden green color, uh, the viscosity of drawn butter. Uh, it's, it's a little peppery. I mean, it's classic Tuscan olive oil. Um, it, yeah, you can you can pretty much make a meal out of it. It's delicious. Yeah, yeah I think that'd be, and Rosie agrees. I think that'd be really fun to do once this COVID yeah, business, absolutely. once the COVID mm -hmm. business is over, mm -hmm. uh, we can wine and olive oil yes. tasting and some good yes. bread. Oh, that would be yeah. so good. Oh, we, yeah, I mean, uh, that olive oil and wheat fields bread, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, an, it's an easy thing. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions from anybody? comments you can unmute yourself i think at this point and um if you have anything to say or questions to ask i think we can just um yeah it's wonderful i love the red but that's my preference good good and i i, I would say also um the uh let the red open i mean definitely take the white and if there is remaining wine, stick that in the fridge. Um, I'd probably, well, you could possibly stick both of them in the fridge, but the, the Syrah, it has enough kind of stuffing and tannic structure that you can cork that up and just set it on a counter. If you want to put it in the fridge, uh, do that. Just let it warm up before you have it, but it's going to continue opening up. Um, it's, it's, it's got a lot of, of antioxidants, which by nature uh, prevent it from oxidizing and, and, so it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna evolve. Um, Clifton followed up on the bread comment. I think, I think he means from wheat fields, but I'm not sure. He said any bread recommendations. Do you mean oh, yeah. with the olive oil, Clifton? Is that what you meant? Let me unmute myself. Yes. Um, yeah, so good. The comment, comment earlier about the crostini. So I was thinking more generally in terms of types of, of bread, whether uh, Steve had any recommendations of what bread would pair with the olive oil with the wine. Oh, I, 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 I am a big fan of Wheatfield's baguettes. Um, I, it, it, trying to think of what else I've used. Nah, nah, I, I, probably the baguette is the one that, that I, I use the most. Um, I like I like the I like the crust. It it it, it, it holds that olive oil uh, really nicely, and so um, yeah, I, I like their I like their baguettes. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, and Maggie says, oh, the Syrah is excellent with filet mignon and burgundy sauce. Is that what you're having tonight, Maggie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sure, yeah. <laughs> they should be outside, well you should be outside grilling. Yeah. Perfect Thursday night meal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're getting raised in the comments. Uh, people love shopping at your store and they're in awe of your knowledge, Steve. And so we thank you so much for doing this yet again. Yes. Oh, I, um, in the dead I, of winter, yeah. <laughs> when we're all cooped up, we really do appreciate it. And well, um, I, 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 I truly enjoyed it. It's great. Um, it's good to be with you all. And, uh, you know, this is wine. Wine is intended as a, as a, um, you know, a conversation lubrication. So uh, <laughs> we're, it's, it's well, it's being well used. Yeah. I have one question. Dave? Uh, yeah. Um, giving up on the point system when you go into a wine store and you have no idea what you're looking for for dinner, is price a good benchmark or not? Un unfortunately, I would say that, I would say probably in the mid 2000s, mid to late 2000s, we all kind of, a lot, a lot of us in the industry kind of got the sense that price and quality weren't correlating the way maybe they had in the past. Um, I, I would, I mean, I, I, I guess I would say, um, unfortunately, like I said, the, the, the points, the points in the, in the store do, absolutely do not guarantee um, that you will like a wine. Um, I mean, for example, um, I don't post them in my store, um, but I know that uh, lots of them have, have points and sometimes very high points. And yet, you know, unless you know that that has been scored well, um, people may not have that reaction. They may not like the wine at all, even though, well, it, it got 95 points. So um, I, I would say as far as picking something, I mean, I, obviously I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to tell you you know, something, I mean, it sounds self-interested, but I, I would say, no, tell, tell the person, you know, at the store, what you're having for dinner and ask them and what you want to spend and, and let them pick something for you. Um, hu humans can do pretty good jobs at selling wine. You know, it's kind of, I, we, we, we make fun of the fact that it's like really a slip of paper with a, a score that, I mean, they mail us stickers that say 90 points on it. We can stick them on anything we want. It, it, it's really, it's embarrassing. I mean, it, it's, there are times where, um, you know, we'll, we'll look at a score. Like I, I, I was putting wine on the shelf uh, yesterday that um, I, I had, the, when we, by the way, when we try the wines, we don't ask the price. And we, we do not ask, I mean, we, we don't care about any of the, the, the scores. We simply try the wine and see what our response is. And in that process, we kind of think about, well, what would we pay for this if we were buying it? And if it's, if it's higher than what we'd pay, we don't put it on the shelf. And if it's less, we do. Anyway, I was putting this bottle on the shelf and it had a 93 point score on it. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I wonder who, who reviewed it. And I, I looked closely. No, it's just 93 points from eh, it, it didn't matter i mean nobody nobody got that far to ask so um so yeah i would i would say uh it, it, it in answer to your original question um rely on the staff i mean i was i spent a lot of time with kind of old you know old classic wine merchants early on in my career and i learned a lot and and we were we didn't have the benefit of a computer in our pocket at that time we didn't have we could look up scores, but usually we had to look up in a paper book uh, what somebody had written about it. Um, and so we really had to rely on, on, on what do we think of this wine? You know, I mean, I always tell people, I'm going to sell you wine. If you hate it and I recommended it, bring it back and I'll get you something else on me um, because you asked. Um, so I, I, I would say, you know, you go into a store, tell them what you want to spend, tell them what you're having for dinner and hopefully they'll do what I would say is their job. All right, <laughs> great. Anybody else? Anyone? Okay, well, let's give Steve a big round of applause. Hello. Thank and, you. Um, Thank you so much.
everybody have a great night. Enjoy your dinner with whatever wine you, you choose. And we will see you next time. That's good. Thank you. Thanks.